Previously, I introduced you to Akhenaten, who's one of the more famous of pharaohs. He's famous because he created, supposedly, a religion based on monotheism, rejecting all the myriad of gods that the Egyptians worship. But as I told you, when I visited the Cairo Museum, I got a very strange feeling about Akhenaten and his predicament in this new religion, which the Egyptians, as a culture, did reject. And he was forced out of the country. And Freud himself has written that he believes Akhenaten is the template for the story of Moses in the Bible. But going back to the fact that Akhenaten is reputed for having created this new religion of monotheism, it appeared to me when I was at this display of him that he was not willingly at the Armana temple. That somehow the military, some invading force, had pretty well kidnapped him and forced he and his wife out to the middle of the desert and creating this whole palace very quickly, not done in the normal construction that the Egyptians would do, but a very quick uh, mud brick kind of temple. And they kept him there away from the Egyptian people. So as I said, it just seemed very fishy to me. And even my guide said, yes, it does seem like he was held captive there rather than willingly there with his wife and children. But he had a nice life. I asked my Egyptian guide, what was it like during that period of time? We're talking about the 13th century before Christ. The Egyptians had a very modern, um, civilized society and civil engineering was their forte. They had flushing toilets, they had running water, they had pipes, etc., etc. Very modern. And as we go through very modern treatises on medicine, they were doing surgeries, they had penicillin, they knew all sorts of um, surgical procedures. They could set bones, they could do uh, deliver babies by cesarean section, that's later on, but Cleopatra's two children were, were uh, delivered uh, by cesarean section, and that was necessary during this period of time because of the bloodlines not mixing. For example, the Rh negative factor now kills, uh, is still a problem for some um, marriages because the wife has antibodies that could kill the fetus if it's not treated correctly. Well, as you know, back then, they were very aware of these bloodlines. And, um, while many people say, oh, well, they kept it in the bloodlines to keep their uh, pure uh, aristocratic blood, my belief is they did it so that they could procreate safely and they did not consider other people that they couldn't procreate with as foreigners they just procreated within their own bloodlines because that was the safest way to reproduce likewise the egyptians did not marry their blood sisters and blood brothers in fact when i was reading egyptian poetry and egyptian love stories they called everyone my little brother my little sister that was a term of endearment because the whole culture of the Egyptian, oh, there was a, it was huge. I don't know exactly how many people, about 50, 60,000 people within certain areas of Egypt. They were all considered brothers and sisters because they were from the same bloodline. Um, it gets all mixed up in the Western mind somehow because uh, our Western history is so dominated by the patriarchy over here in the U.S. that it's re very refreshing to go and actually go to the countries where the guides know the real history because my, the guide, I had was very clear that the Egyptian priesthood was run by women and that if you were a man that wanted to be part of the female priesthood, you would have to, like they said, uh, <laughs> you'd have to become a eunuch. And if you wanted it that badly, then you could become a feminized priestess and live with the priestesses in the temple. Um, and in, in fact, that is my belief where they also, the Jewish, it is my belief that the Jewish practice of circumcision also is a symbolic gesture toward a man becoming a eunuch in order to commune with God because a man would be so disruptive while the uh, female priests were um, doing their priestly work, which is to search the stars, track the stars, uh, find out when planting season is. In fact, harmonizing the Egyptian community to the seasons and the will of God as God turns the universe and uh, allows this agricultural country 
basically become the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. Egypt, for hundreds of years, fed the entire Mediterranean uh, uh, civilization. But let's just go back to how I viewed this display. This statue of Akhenaten is huge, and standing beneath it, I probably came up to, oh, his knees, uh, as I recall. But as you can tell, he has a very masculine face. But look at this round belly and round hips. And then there's breasts here, not large ones, but it's just a very feminine, curvy um, physique. And so when I asked my guide why, in fact, did Akhenaten have this, this strange feminized physique, my guide told me, well, it was probably some sort of genetic syndrome uh, that they can't really put their finger on. But you know, I was just struck with the fact that Akhenaten might have been a hermaphrodite. He had both male and female features, and a hermaphrodite was seen as something very special. I don't know, but that's my feeling. And do you know, Akhenaten is looked back on, as I said, Freud believes that he's the template for Moses, and I'll show you further how he is also appears from the icon, from the statuary and different things and different reliefs I saw in that temple. He also seems to be the template for Jesus Christ of the New Testament. Here he is again in a pose without clothes and as you can see very wide hips. Here is Nefertiti, his wife, and she's wearing this large headdress and it appears to be covering a very strange skull and uh, it's a very elongated skull. Now this is a statue that's supposed to represent what these um, people looked like and so I don't know why they would do this huge skull unless this is how they looked. So as we can tell from at least there's an indication from this display at the Cairo Museum, it appears that there is a very strong indication that the ancient Egyptians were of a different, uh, I can't say race, almost a different genus of hominid. And that, as we can tell from our bloodlines now, blood didn't mix. There were very different type of hominids. And that, not as they tell us today, that we're all one and the same. We are not. There are very different type of cultures and different types of genetic codes that go in to make various different characteristics of humans. Some get along, some don't. Some are quiet like the Asians. Some are loud like uh, the Italians. Some are, you know, there's just a cultural uh, personality that comes through the genetics of a certain culture. Also in the Cairo Museum are the rooms in which the mummies are kept in glass cases. And I want you to see this skull. This is exactly as I saw these mummies. I had to bend down uh, uh, because they were below me at about oh, a stomach level. And so to see this arch curve of their necks, you can see that is just a very strange angle. And look at the, um, the head at the back, which almost seems to be insect-like. It's almost ant-like. Anyway, it's a huge head. And I witnessed this myself, and I do have my own photographs. I pulled this one off the internet just for convenience sake. But I, you are not supposed to take photographs <laughs> in the display, but I just happened to kind of snap a few as I walked by some of these mummies. And what's also interesting is that some of them have uh, this red hair that's still uh, attached to the skull. But also, this does explain one other thing. As you're going through the Cairo Museum, you'll see um, Tutankhamun's bed and different pharaohs' bed. Well, it has that head brace that we see in old films where it's like a T brace. And 
and you lay your head on it, your neck on it. And I asked my guide, I said, that brace looks so uncomfortable. Why would anybody want to sleep with that brace? This was before I saw the nature of their heads. And he said, oh, the reason for that is because they did not want to muss up their wigs because it took them so long to plait and braid those beautiful wigs. Well, when I saw the mummy's heads, I knew why they had that T-bar there. And that was so they could sleep on their backs and not crush the back of their heads. They must have slept very soundly on their back because I could never even sleep on a T-bar. I can't even sleep on my back now. Now, it's been reputed by various religious leaders and alternative anthropologists that there was actually a race of giants that pre-existed modern man. And the Bible refer refers to these giants as the Nephilim, or the fallen angels. Notwithstanding, there are several alternative Christian writers and anthropologists that state that when the Westerners moved west on, in the United States, they found in the Grand Canyon and various canyons like Chaco Canyon in Arizona, New Mexico, skeletons of large humans. When these skeletons were found by different pioneers and different Western people, articles were written about them in the 1820s. And supposedly, when these skeletons were found, the Smithsonian came forward and demanded that all the skeletons be turned over to them. And many believe, or some still believe, that those skeletons may still exist, and they exist down in the bowels of the Smithsonian. Well, these giants are also reputed to have six fingers. Now, none of these skeletons appear to have six fingers, but that is what um, certain people are saying, that these were skeletons of six-fingered giants. And here are some other pictures of people with giantism, and there's some kind of creature they found in the Smithsonian. Um, so there are known genetic defects, such as Marfan's disease or syndrome, in which people have a giantism. And then there's also these strange elongated skulls. Um, many uh, anthropologists believe that these are fake, but they really do not seem to be fake. Um, somebody would have had to go, go to a lot of trouble. And accordingly, I've seen some of these up close, and they don't have the correct seams on the um, skull. Um, so they're not just uh, deformed skulls because of head boarding. These are skulls with different seams, different eye sockets, different jaws. They don't look anything like modern human. And here we have again some giant human skeletons. They say they found these various ones. Here's a huge one. I don't know if this is true or not, but of course there's so many references to it in our mythology. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of the Englishmen, which are giants that were known to live in the hills that would be cannibals. Um, there's the giants mentioned in the Bible. There's the giants all through our uh, fairy tales, our stories of mythologies. Um, that one has to assume there are there is a core of truth and not just to dismiss them because we do not happen to see them today. We need to understand the earth is the universe of 13.5 billion years. There is life potentially every place in this universe. So naturally we are being very close minded if we do not start to accept some of these things that might occur before we were even in the modern age. And some of these creatures, hominids, such as the Neanderthals and the uh, Basque man and the different uh, skeletons they have found that predate modern man, we have to assume that these creatures, perhaps not creatures, but pre-modern man did have communities and live very similar to us, perhaps. We don't know. But let's go on. And here again we have Barack Obama with his Let's see, six fingers, I don't know, but he certainly has a long index for a thumb. 
So what was strange about this is that I happened to look up at the Rothschild uh, Wikipedia entry, and this is the weekend. This is a picture of David Rothschild, a scion or the heir of one of the Rothschilds, and he's known as an adventurer. He was born in 1978, quite good looking as you can see, but something strange hit me about the way he's holding his hands. And let me tell you, this is very strange. It looks as though this is the thumb. It's a very long thumb, wouldn't you say? That's a very long thumb for most people. And we can see the knuckles of his four fingers here. And that thumb almost looks like one, two, maybe three knuckles, but that's not a normal human thumb, if it is indeed a thumb. But look at this left hand that he has. He has what looks like to be his index finger pointing outward and his thumb tucked back behind his hand with only three fingers. And it's like he's playing a joke or being sarcastic with us or flashing a signal to people who are in the know that he indeed has a long thumb which is equal in length almost to his index finger. That is a very strange thumb. And with all the hand signals going on, I wonder if I've missed something, because I know about the Masonic hand signals. I know about the Rosicrucian hand signals. I know all about them, but I never thought that it also might be flashing some sort of inherited genetic characteristic, such as long fingers, exceptionally long fingers, which these bloodline families may be proud of. Do you remember the joke? that one of the politicians pulled on Donald Trump when he said, oh, I think it was Comey, look at his hands, look at his hands, indicating they weren't aristocrats. Uh, look at his hands, they were saying, look at Trump's hands. And what it was referring to is how small they were and people thought it was a joke comparing his hands to his penis. But it also very well could be saying, well, Donald Trump isn't the right bloodline because he does not have this genetic marker of this exceptionally long thumb. Now, so I decided to investigate and look further. What genetic characteristic is marked by a long thumb? And so when I looked for genetic disorders, characterized by elongated fingers or an elongated thumb, I came up with Kleinfelder syndrome. And what Kleinfelder syndrome is, it's called the 47 chromosome disorder. It usually affects men, but your gender identity is later discovered after you grow into it. But men, are born with two X chromosomes and one Y. So there's an extra X chromosome. And this creates a person who is taller than normal and fingers that are longer than normal. It has additional issues. It, it, there are learning disabilities that are associated with it and a lower IQ, but not very severe so that many men do not even know they go through life with an extra X chromosome. But this is an interesting article because what I showed you was Obama and Rothschild showing you a hand in which the thumb looked like an index finger. And what does an index finger have? It has three it has three uh, phalangels. It has three phalanx. And so here is a article which talks about the fact that they've recently discovered that characteristic of Klinefelter syndrome is also a thumb with three knuckles or three joints, which is uncharacteristic of most thumbs. Most thumbs only have two joints, but those who are born with Klinefelter's syndrome may at times have three joints, hence a thumb that looks like 
and index finger. And here's the abstract. It's entitled Triphalangeal Thumb with Delta Phalanx in a Case of a Klinefelter Syndrome. We report a case of Klinefelter Syndrome owing to the maternal mediotic error associated with the triphalangeal thumb and the delta phalanx bilaterally. There are no previous reports of similar cases and the triphalangealism with the delta phalanx abnormalities of both thumbs might therefore be considered a further but rare manifestation of this issue. And here's an article from Mercola. It's kind of an interesting article. It states here that a genetic biologist has been studying the length of fingers and associating these fingers or the length with certain characteristics. Therefore, he has found that men who normally have a 96% shorter index finger are usually than their ring finger are usually outgoing more aggressive and more successful than those men who have happen to have a longer ring finger than index finger what also made me happy about this article was with all the videos going around the internet showing that Michelle Obama might be a hermaphrodite or a man because of her longer um, digit of her um, ring finger. I can't remember. Anyway, um, it said that the women usually have the opposite. Well, this article states that women, basically their ring and their index finger should be about one to one. I'm going to read it. What the length of your index finger says about you. For many decades, scientists have noticed an extraordinary link between the length of your ring and index finger and a pl plethora of apparently unrelated traits. Evidence is growing that this digit ratio effect is real. Recently, strong evidence has emerged that men whose index fingers are longer than their ring fingers are significantly less likely to develop prostate cancer. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> to work out the ratio of your fingers, measure the distance from the midpoint, etc. Okay, but let's look at what other traits I have. Okay, it says that the ratio of your index should be generally 0.96 the length of your ring finger. Women generally have a high digit ratio of one as their index fingers and ring fingers tend to be nearly the same length. And that's what gave me some satisfaction that at least my similar digit lengths are not that normal. Research by Manning and others suggests that greater exposure to testosterone in the womb increases the chances of having a more masculine hand and the opposite with estrogen. There is some compelling research showing that exposure to less ideal hormone concentrations developed in stages. The new field of epigenetics has shown that the choice of which your genes are expressed or activated is strongly affected by your environment. There you have it. it. says the environment will turn on genes and turn off genes. So therefore, environment is very important. High stress environments turn on different genes as those who are, live in low stress environments.
here it says, you do not manifest a disease merely by a defective gene, but by your epige epigenome, epigenetic therapy, which is essentially curing of a disease. And here are displays of many different hands. Look at this man's hand here. Unbelievable. And here it's measuring the ring finger should be shorter than. Now here's Obama showing his hands proudly. Look at these long fingers, but look at that long thumb. Interesting, isn't it? Forty seven XXY, or more commonly known as Klinefelter syndrome, can occur in one in five hundred individuals. Klinefelter syndrome is one of the most common chromosomal variations where a child is born with forty seven chromosomes instead of forty six. The forty seventh chromosome is an extra X chromosome. Here are some of their stories, and here is what they need. Colton. Yeah, Colton, how old are you, buddy? Three and a half. You're three and a half. Hi, my name is Joey. Here, this is Noah. Hi. I'm George. Hi, my name's Amy. Hi, I'm Isaac. Hello, my name is Leela. Hi, my name's Mark. What's going on, everybody? My name is Ryan Briganti. I'm, my, my name is Kelsey. Hi, I'm Ron. I'm Sam. Hey, what's going on guys? This is Ryan with Living With XXY. This is my first YouTube post and I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so basically what this channel is about is my life and living with Klinefelter Syndrome, which is also known as 47XXY. Uh, you're probably wondering what Klinefelter Syndrome is and basically what it is is I was born with two X chromosomes and one Y chromosome. Um, so this is kind of like living proof of that you can be successful, you can live a positive life, you won't let what you're diagnosed with when you're long, younger hold you back or tell you who you are or actually defy who you are. Um, I've never let it defy me and I never will. Yes, we have side effects. Um, some of those side effects include being sterile, unable to have kids. Uh, we have tons of learning disabilities, but you just gotta work harder at it. Uh, I've, I've struggled from spelling reading, writing, pretty much anything audio, that uh, taking notes in class when I was a kid. Um, and I still struggle with spelling, reading, writing a lot. Um, another kind of thing that we have to do is we all have to take some type of testosterone, whether it be injecting ourselves with a needle. Um, I actually inject myself with a needle. I do it every seven days. Um, some people take something called Androgel, which is a rub-on cream that they rub on their body every day. Um, some other basic side effects are we kind of carry all of our weight in our stomach and our hips. We have, lot, uh, we have large hips. Um, for being 6'4", I wear a size 36, but I don't see that that's any different than anybody else. I mean, some of my guy friends have a little bit smaller waist, 34, 32. Um, so other than that, those are kind of like the negative connotations. As far as all the positive stuff goes, oh, there's so much, which I'm so thankful for. And I wouldn't want to live life any other way. Um, so basically, I'm right-brained. And I've taken a liking to cooking and photography as my two professions. 
Um, we also have a really good visual memory, super hands-on. So when I was a kid playing with Legos and all that hands-on building, kinetic, all that stuff was amazing. And I have so much fun doing it even to this day. Um, we're tall and super caring for lots of people. So guys, just a little definition of what Kleinfelder syndrome is to me. I'll definitely be doing some more in-depth talking um, on my channel. Feel free to subscribe, follow me, do all that stuff that everybody tells you to do on YouTube. And thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Kleinfelter syndrome. This is an article dealing with famous people who have this syndrome. And you are going to be surprised. They believe that George Washington suffered from Kleinfelter syndrome. He was especially tall, around 6'2", and that's very tall for the age. Also, he was unable to have children with Martha. But of course, men back then very often married widows, which Martha was a wealthy widow which made George Washington, a poor relation of the Spencer family in England, very wealthy. Then Lily Elby, which is a Danish artist born in 1882. His childhood, I guess he was raised as a boy and then later became a girl. Veronica Francoise Caroline Renaud, she is a pro-Tibetan activist. Very pretty, very stately woman. Here's Caroline Kosi. Um, suffers from XXY. She possessed the genotype of oh, triple XXY, which makes her more at risk of having a lower IQ. But the six-footed male became a female and is currently living in the U.S. She also played a role in the Bond movie in 1981, um, etc. And here's a an Olympian, I think, famous athlete born in South Africa. And guess what? They say Tom Cruise suffers from it. He's rather short, though. The other one I thought was interesting is Jamie Lee Curtis. I just have always liked her. Um, on the masculine side, great muscle tone, but just a lovely, lovely woman. I like her a lot. But the most famous of all is Akhenaten's son, King Tutankhamun. There you have it. Akhenaten more than likely had Kleinfelter syndrome. I don't know who Janet Mock is, Lauren Foster. Not really interested in her. Adele Markham. Renee Richards. She's a famous ophthalmologist. Okay, if two ten common, which we know from his skeleton and his coffin, he was short, had a twisted leg, died probably from a fall of some sort. Um, but at that point, Akhenaten had left Egypt, but I'm going to show you Akhenaten. Definitely looks hermaphroditic or Kleinfelter syndrome disorder.